Kitchen, and we're here at ASIN 2013 with Sarah Alice Lindholm. Did I yes. say that correctly? You did. Good. All right. How did you get started with Funimation? Well, I actually started my anime career working freelance for AD Vision down in Houston. Yeah, and I was in-house with them for several years. So I was a translator and then I also did DVD coordination. So I kind of saw both ends of the spectrum of making anime. And in uh, 2008, I went freelance again and Clarine Harp, who is now my boss at Funimation, had apparently seen some of my shows and like what she saw. So when uh, I contacted her and we started doing freelance, she talked to me about perhaps coming in-house. And I'm the first translator that's ever been in-house in Funimation. So it's kind of great because I get to make up my job. <laughs> awesome. Uh, can you tell us about that work as a quality assurance translator for Funimation? Oh, absolutely. So what quality assurance translator means is that while well, I also still translate my own shows, other people's shows, about 20% of them, I also proofread and I rotate between the different Funimation translators. And what it does is it gives you guys quality control for watching the anime, but it also allows them an opportunity for feedback and development, which no one else in the industry is getting right now. And that's hugely important. When I was freelance, um, whatever my client was, I almost never knew whether they even liked it, like let alone if there was anything wrong. It's a very common problem when you're a freelance translator. So with this, I have the opportunity to help everyone in the way that my mentor helped me, and it's really positive, and I think it ups the quality of translation in the industry. They have me there to ask questions, even if I'm not working on it. They can call me and say, oh my gosh, this person is mumbling in this extra, can you listen to it? And that's completely unique, and I really love the chance to do it. All right. Um, do you work closely with others within the world of Funimation, or is the transition pretty solitary work? Oh, okay, good. So when I was free ta freelance, translation was completely solitary. And then coming to Funimation, I think I got spoiled because normally it would still be just me in a dark cave doing my thing while others were outside. But um, since I'm the only one there, uh, I can talk to people and be the first translator that they've had the chance to talk to and then we become really interested in each other. Because I like to hear from marketing and find out what their perspective is. And, uh, and that can sort of help me see what the whole headspace for the property is. And it's this great thing. So I actually talk to a lot of other people in the company. All right, wonderful. Um, what are some of the differences between translating for anime, video games? Uh, what's the differences between media when you're working as a translator? OK, great question. Um, video game translation is very different in that it's all spreadsheets, yeah. pretty much. Like, you, you don't have the dialogue that you're listening to, that's all going to be recorded later. Um, you have a spreadsheet that's a million cells long with the Japanese and the Chinese and the Italian and the Russian and you're all working on it at the same time. And you just see tiny snippets of, of this menu has these options. And if you're lucky, they give you a screenshot of the menu so you know what menu it is and what the button is supposed to do, what it's saying. And then it's you doing tiny, tiny, tiny snippets. Also, um, even in the dialogue, or just in the game dialogue, as in when the button pops up and says, this is what you should do next, there's a very tight character restriction. So that, because that box is very small and it can't change size. You have to fit the English inside it. So it's this constant tweaking of one character too long. Okay, how could I change the whole thing so that it's one character shorter? And in anime, I have a lot more freedom. And I also get the chance to hear the performance instead of just read the text, and that changes the whole experience. Uh, one thing about video games is that there's, originally there was a lot of uh, katakana in video yeah. games because of memory restrictions. Yeah. It, has that still carried over, or is it, uh, are they using a lot more hiragana, kanji, right, uh, right, other right. character sets? Okay, so um, right now I play all the Kingdom Hearts games in Japanese, so yeah. like I'm seeing them as they come out. And there's a lot more kanji now. Yeah. So, um, like, and kanji looked like crap on the PS1. Yeah. Like, it, it just looked like somebody squashed a bug on the screen. Like, you couldn't tell what it was. Um, and the newer consoles, you really do see a difference. Everybody's names are still in hiragana katakana. Like, nobody has kanji in their name. Yeah. And a lot of the, the magic spells, so if you have the little menu at the side that's attack, magic, that is still all in hiragana katakana because you need to be able to read it fast in a fight, right? Yeah. And that's, it's still hard to read the kanji that fast. So you're going to see the kanji on the settings menu, the main menu, and the dialogue subtitles. But when you're making decisions at a fast rate, it's all still hiragana katakana. Awesome. Uh, were there challenges for uh, Black Butler that you had to deal with in your translation work? Yes, there were. <laughs> um, OK, so the first season of Black Butler 
was great because it wasn't a simulcast, so I had the opportunity to watch it all and map out a plan. You know, you have more time. So one of the biggest things in Black Butler, besides the puns, which lots of puns, was that since it's set in Britain, yeah, it's set within the aristocracy structure. And that's a structure that already exists. Yeah. And we know about it. You know, we watch Doctor Who, we watch Downton Abbey, we're aware of that as English speakers in a way that the Japanese creators have less everyday exposure to. And since it's not their language, they can kind of fudge it a lot. Like they don't have to call the lords lords and the, the dukes dukes and all of that. They can just use honorifics that seem nice in the context. But to us, we notice if it's not perfect with the actual structure in Britain, because that's our language. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time drawing charts, being like, okay, it's 1888. In 1888, how did I address a duke? If I'm writing to the baron, how is that different than when I'm talking to the baron? So I did a ton of historical research, spent a lot of time on etymology.com, all of that stuff. And that was, that was the big thing in Black Butler. And other than that, it was the puns. But puns, in addition to being challenging work, are also the most satisfying. You just feel like a winner when you get it right. So that's a good feeling. Yeah. On the other end, there's um, cultural references, uh, context that may not carry over from the Japanese side. A good example of that would be uh, Crayon Chin Chan. Right. Uh, like, uh, what kind of challenges do you have when you're bringing stuff over where there is uh, Japanese cultural references that may not necessarily apply? How is the dialogue adjusted uh, right. in those instances? Right. Um, a lot of the times, I can keep it in. I might have to add a word. Like, good example that came up, I think, in Red Data Girl recently um, is there was a discussion of the legend that's actually, I forget which Kurosawa movie, but the one that George Lucas got Star Wars from where there's the woman trapped in the cave with the boulder in front of it. I don't know if you know what I mean. I can't think of the title. I'm sorry, Kurosawa, I'm so sorry. Um, but that legend with the cave and the boulder and in the Japanese dialogue, it's just, okay, so remember that story about the girl in the cave? Then when the guy comes and destroys the boulder, blah, blah, blah. And in English, if you don't know there's a boulder, you're sitting there going, well, what the heck? What's going on? I heard a cave and a girl and somebody destroyed a rock. I can't follow this because it's a cultural reference that we don't have. But just by adding, she was trapped in the cave behind a boulder, then when I crush the boulder, it makes sense. So it's just a couple of words. Other times, like Princess Jellyfish, which is one of my favorite things that I've ever translated. I love it so much. Um, I had the opportunity to, I translated everything in the dialogue so that you had the same experience of this esoteric crazy dialogue that didn't really make sense to Japanese people either, honestly, but there were lots of little references. But I was able to do liner notes on the DVD. So you can go to the Princess Jellyfish Field Guide and get to see all the little tiny things that I researched that you didn't get in the dialogue is available to you on the disc, which is, I love doing that. Yeah. No, that's absolutely wonderful because uh, Animago used to do that with a lot of their stuff, like with the Urdesei Atsura and things like that. Absolutely. And it's wonderful to see that Funimation is doing that. Yeah, I, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. I Yeah, I did it on this ugly, yeah, beautiful world. And I just feel good when I can provide that. And I loved it when Animago did it too. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, how have you been enjoying your time here at Chicago and at Anime Central? This is my very first Anime Central, and everyone told me Anime Central is great, and I thought, well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I really, it is great. <laughs> um, the crowd is such a good crowd. You know, I've been to other cons, and each has its own kind of flavor. Asen is so relaxed. Like, it's, it's a happier vibe, and everyone is, is really interested. When I gave my panel, everyone was very engaged. But in a very zen way. I mean, they're just fun. It's yeah. fun here. Awesome. Uh, do you have any uh, final words to get out to the fans? Uh, any future projects that you can tell them about? Uh, ways they can get in touch with you at Funimation, maybe? <laughs> um, sure. OK, you can actually get in touch with me even just by going through feedback or HR at Funimation.com. Feedback at Funimation.com is great because we read all of that. And if there's something directed towards me, the person who reads that will send it to me. So you can absolutely find me through that. Everything gets directed to where it needs to go. Um, I'm working right now on a simulcast called The Devil is a Part-Timer, which is super fun. Um, it's a little bit challenging. There's lots of dialogue, but it is high fantasy, which I almost never get to do. Yeah. And it is cute and funny and has a really broad audience appeal. It's not just the 17-year-old boys or the 18-year-old, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really widely enjoyable. And I love doing the comedy can't talk about future projects, but I would absolutely, I guess if there was one thing that I could say to fans, 
I would say we are loving what we're doing just as much as you are. Like when I work on a show, I really cherish it because that's what I owe to the show and its creator is to treat it as my baby. It was the creator's baby, so now it's gonna be my baby. So when you see it, you just know that the love is from all of us and you're getting the best that we can possibly give you. It's wonderful to know that fans are really getting heart with their product. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah Oslindholm, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful talking to you. It was fun, thank you very much.